Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on geriatrics. Today, we're going to talk about some common geriatric diseases. We're going to talk about management for those diseases, and we're going to talk about some common illnesses affecting the geriatric population. Geriatrics is the study and the treatment of diseases affecting the elderly. Gerontology is the study of the effects of aging on the elderly population. The geriatric population, or the population over 65, is one of the fastest growing populations in America. Specifically, in West Virginia, 16% of our population is over the age of 65, and that number is suspected to double by 2025. That makes us the second highest geriatric population in the nation here in our state. So why is the geriatric population growing so fast? By 2030, there will be 70 million people over the age of 65 in America. This is because the baby boomers are starting to retire. If you'll remember, the baby boomers were those born between 1950 and 1970, and that was just said to be one of the largest generations in American history. That generation is living longer, mainly because there's been an absence of major catastrophes or wars to thin out the population, and healthcare standards have significantly improved than that of generations prior to them. There are many societal issues affecting the elderly population today, not the least of which is fixed income. Most elderly people in America are living on social security benefits and perhaps a small pension or retirement. This makes it very difficult for them to afford meds, food, and basic living arrangements. In the absence of a large retirement fund or savings account, elderly people are having a hard time affording basic necessities. Throw on top of that the loss of a spouse and their source of income, housing can be a very big issue for the elderly. That's why we've seen a rise in the number of large apartment complexes for the elderly. I'm sure everyone can think of one or two of those buildings in their area. We've also seen a rise in retirement communities or personal care homes, a place for the elderly to go once they can no longer take care of themselves. In dealing with elderly patients, ethics comes into play a whole lot. What were the patient's wishes for the end of their life? Who makes those decisions and how do you go about it? The cut and dry answer is that unless there is that pretty pink DNR paper present, you need to work the patient as would be appropriate. West Virginia advanced directives are either bright pink or bright orange, so they should be easy to find. You may be questioned with patients that have multiple decision makers. Perhaps they have a medical power of attorney or living will, but those do not necessarily mean do not resuscitate. Unless there's that pink paper there with the patient's and the doctor's signature on it, you should provide resuscitative measures as would normally be appropriate. What's to stop the grandkids from slipping grandpa some arsenic in his coffee every morning and then killing him off for his money and telling you not to resuscitating, resuscitate him when you show up? It's a very slippery slope. Medcom can always be consulted for advice about this, and Medcom also has access to the Advanced Directive Registry. So if the family is telling you there is a DNR on file, but they can't find it, Medcom should be able to look it up for you. The elderly, as I said before, have very limited financial resources, and their health insurance is limited as well. Medicare and Medicaid don't pay for a whole lot, and not many of our elderly population are lucky enough to have a Medicare supplement insurance company. The VA is a little bit better in paying for things, but it's still not great, so many elderly people find themselves struggling with the decision of whether they're going to pay for their meds that month or pay for food. There's been a bit of a paradigm shift in the last 10 years with healthcare. Insurance companies are figuring out that it's cheaper to take care of someone at home than it is to take care of them in the hospital. That's why we've seen a rise in the number of hospice patients. We've seen a rise in the number of home health pa patients, and soon we're going to see community paramedic come around. It's 
much more cost effective to pay a paramedic to go into somebody's house, eliminate some slip, trip, and fall hazards, check on them two or three times a week, check their meds, that they're taking them appropriately, perhaps get a weight if you're worried about fluid, check their vital signs, maybe run an EKG. All these little things add up to decreased hospital time. West Virginia is actually on the forefront of community paramedicine, and right now there are pilot programs running in three counties in our state. I believe in the next two to five years, we're going to see community paramedicine being commonplace. There are also plenty of self-help places for seniors. I'm sure every county has a senior center that gives seniors a place to go have lunch every day and just interact with other people of their age. There are senior golf clubs, religious organizations, some government agencies. There are places there for seniors to help take care of themselves and to interact with others of their age. Here are some prevention strategies listed to help older people maintain their good quality of life. And a lot of these things, if you think about it, the community paramedic could be very helpful with. Now we're going to talk about some specific diseases and their general management and assessment. It's a fact of life that our body becomes less efficient with age. And when one system starts to go, it seems to affect many others. That's where we run into comorbidity or patients with many different diseases that all interact with each other. Hypertension leads to heart failure, which leads to renal failure, which leads to fluid in the lungs and all of these other things add up and start compounding and make it very difficult for the elderly to maintain a healthy body, especially when you throw in something like a cold or an injury or the flu or pneumonia makes it very difficult for these patients to combat and recover from simple illnesses. Many of the chronic diseases that the elderly are faced with lead to a bunch of different medications, and this ends up in things we call polypharmacy, taking many different medications to combat different diseases. Sometimes the drug dosages have to be changed so they don't end up in a, at a toxic level, and sometimes drugs interact with each other. When you end up with a bunch of comorbid diseases and see a different specialist for every disease, the doctors don't always talk to each other. So something that the family doctor puts the patient on might interact with something the cardiologist puts the patient on, and then you end up getting called when they're not feeling right. So polypharmacy is a challenge for us as EMS professionals to take a look at their medicines and make sure they're not interacting with each other or the medicine is not what's causing the problem or the cause for your visit today. Elderly also tend to be less compliant with their medications, whether it's because they can't get them or they're not taking them correctly due to memory loss or sensory impairment. Sometimes the elderly just get scared of medications. The doctor puts them on a new one and they think, I'm not gonna take that today because I'm a little scared of it and I'm not sure what it's gonna do to me. There are a lot of programs out there now to increase compliance in the elderly with their medications. Uh, if you go into homes now, you'll see little rolls of medications that are prepackaged daily or sometimes twice daily. I've seen them a few times and it's actually pretty cool. Uh, one of our pharmacies here in Marion County is doing it and they will package the medications for that day by AM and PM and all the patient has to do is tear the piece of cellophane off of the roll, dump out their pills and take them. And it's set up for time and for day. Uh, they will even deliver these medicines to their house. So the elderly person doesn't even have to leave their house to get their medicines. It's a very cool program. Problems with mobility and falls. Falls are the leading cause of accidental death in the elderly. So falls can be a big issue. Poor nutrition, difficulty with walking or difficulty holding their bladder sometimes leads to falls. They are at a greater predisposition for falls. If you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, a little confused trying to shake off the fog of being sleepy uh, and end up tripping over the rug as an elderly person, that can be a much bigger deal than if it's a younger person. Again, the fa falls are the leading cause of accidental death in the elderly. So the elderly should be encouraged to make their home safe. Uh, this is one of the big things that the community paramedic can help with. Uh, one of the big advocates for community paramedicine tells a story about a patient in Texas somewhere that called 
almost 300 times in one year for 911. Uh, they sent a community paramedic out. They found that every morning she was tripping on the way to get her newspaper. So the community paramedic came in, did some fall proofing to the house, put in a rail for her to be able to get out to her newspaper every morning, and they eliminated 90% of her 911 calls for the year. So fall proofing the house can go a long way towards keeping the elderly safe. And this is something you can do as a paramedic if you find that you're going out to the same patient two or three times a week for a fall. They're not going to the hospital. They've just fallen down, need help getting up. This is something that you can do as a field paramedic. Go through the house and try and figure out what it is they're tripping on and make it safe for them. And here's a look at some fall prevention strategies that you can do as the field paramedic or EMT when you're going out to patients' houses. Communication difficulties are often present with the elderly. Just like the rest of the body, hearing becomes much less efficient with age. They become hard of hearing. Sometimes they have impaired vision with glaucoma. They have a lower sensitivity to touch. All of these things can create communication difficulties with your patient. An easy trick to ease communication with your patient, put your stethoscope in their ears and talk into it. That's gonna amplify your voice so you don't have to yell and make it easier to communicate with your elderly patient. One of the biggest problems I see is that providers will go out to these homes and because the patient can't hear, they end up talking down to them like they're a little kid or talking to them like they're mentally impaired. That's not the case, they just can't hear you. So talk normally, just talk a little louder. And here's a good chart breaking down those communication difficulties that I just talked about. So a general health assessment is something that you could do on every patient. I think it's something as paramedics that we forget about a lot of the time because we're focused on the here and now and the problem that we're there for. But it's important to get a good general health assessment. Maybe that you can report it to the hospital and help get them pointed in the right direction uh, for the care they need. And you can take a look at their living situation, their level of activity, uh, their network of social support, their level of independence, medications, sleep patterns. All these things are going to lead up and culminate in their overall well-being. If you can get a good assessment of these things in the house and report that to the hospital, the patient may be able to get the help they need to either get into an assisted living facility or somewhere where they can thrive a little better rather than being at home alone perhaps without any social network or any support or any activity. Living in that kind of situation is going to lead to poor overall health. Gathering a history of present illness and a past medical history from the elderly patient can be difficult. Sometimes their chief complaints are vague. Sometimes they have a really high pain tolerance, so what might to a younger person be severe pain to them is just a little bit. Uh, sometimes they have very lengthy medical histories. Sometimes they have very lengthy history of present illness. It's been going on for a while, for years even, but they've called today because something has made it worse. Uh, if they have a lot of medical history, they have a lot of diseases, be prepared for multiple medications. Also keep in mind that some elderly patients believe that because they take a medicine for something, they no longer have it. So make sure you ask about history and what meds they take. Um, I see a lot of times with elderly people, they take a blood pressure pill, but when you ask them about their past history, they don't have high blood pressure because in their mind, the medicine they're taking for it fixes it. Altered mental status and confusion. It's easy to assume that an elderly person is confused because they are old and demented, but oftentimes that's not the case. We don't want to write patients off as being just senile without ruling out other extrinsic and intrinsic causes. Uh, you can see here that there's a lot of causes of altered mental status, anything from traumatic head injuries to decreased blood sugar levels to hypothermia to hypoxia. So you want to go down through your checklist and check off all these things before you write them off as having dementia or senility. Physical exam considerations in the elderly patient is mostly the same as in an adult patient, with a few differences. Keep in mind, they might have lots of layers of clothing that you have to dig through to get to what you actually need to examine. They may have many symptoms and you need to be able to prioritize what you want to look at first. Modesty is often not a concern for the elderly patient, 
but it should always be a concern for us. We should do our best to protect patients' modesty at all times. Once we've done our history and our assessment, then we move on to management. Like with any patient, we need to fix their problems. So if they're having breathing problems, we need to fix those. If they're having chest, chest pains, we need to fix that. But oftentimes with the elderly patient, the best treatment can be a hand to hold and an ear to listen. A lot of times elderly people call 911 just for somebody to talk to. So don't rule out emotional support as a treatment option for your elderly patients. Here's a good overview of system changes in the elderly. Big ones to look at are the musculoskeletal system, osteoporosis and osteoarthritis causing brittle bones, so fractures are easier to come by. Neurological system, the brain, like the rest of the body, is less efficient with age, so altered mental status and dementia are common. The skin, the skin tears easier, it's more like paper. So we see more lacerations and skin tears. And you can read the rest of those. I highlighted the big ones for you, things to think about that we see the most of. Now we're going to talk through some common medical problems in the elderly. Respiratory disorders are one of the most common diseases we see in the elderly. The main reason, I think, is because we didn't know it was bad to smoke back in the day when these people were growing up. So they all smoked one, two packs a day for years maybe, till they found out that it was bad for them and they quit. So COPD, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, asthma are all very common in the elderly. Environmental factors can sometimes trigger respiratory distress. When it gets cold out or the weather changes, everybody with COPD gets sick. Uh, some other things worth noting are congestive heart failure. Uh, we talked about once you have that first heart attack, then part of that heart dies, the pump just doesn't work as well, especially as you get older. So we see congestive heart failure a lot. Uh, pulmonary embolism is more common because the clotting factors change as we get older, uh, and pneumonia is much easier to contract as an elderly patient. Cardiovascular disease are probably the second most common. Seems like every third call of the day that we get dispatched on is a chest pain call. Very few of them are actually MIs, but we have to treat them all, every chest pain call, like a myocardial infarction until we can prove otherwise. Angina is usually fairly simple and is usually triggered by physical activity. Most of the time it is relieved by one nitroglycerin or by resting. Then the oxygen demand decreases and the pain goes away. With myocardial infarction, the elderly are less likely to present with classic symptoms. They may have the silent MI or like a weird pain, maybe in their shoulder or their neck or their jaw, especially with females. Uh, early detection is important, so do your 12 leads early and often. Heart failure occurs when the body or when the heart cannot meet the body's demands. So the pump is just not as efficient as it used to be. This happens with age or sometimes with a myocardial infarction or sometimes both. Signs and symptoms, dependent edema, that's gonna be your right-sided heart failure, or the right side of the heart failure to pump blood away from the rest of the body, and then uh, backing up in the lungs, that's your left-sided heart failure. Left ventricular hypertrophy is worth noting because it's a progressive disease. You don't just end up with LVH overnight. It's a thickening of the ventricle wall caused by long-term hypertension and you can see it on V1 through V6 on your 12 lead. You, if you have a measurement of greater than 35 millimeters from your deepest S wave in V1 to V3, or your tallest R wave in V4 to V6, then that is LVH by voltage requirements. It can obscure the diagnosis of a myocardial infarction in those leads. So essentially the only MI you can diagnose in the presence of LVH is an inferior wall. Aortic dissections and aneurysms. These patients will be very sick, uh, especially if the aneurysm goes to rupture. Um, the most common causes are atherosclerosis with hypo hypertension, but there are some secondary causes. Blunt chest trauma can cause it, and Marfan syndrome. Uh, Marfan syndrome affects many symptom systems of the body, uh, but one of them is the vascular system, and it causes the vessels to be thinner. Uh, 
Uh, people with Marfan syndrome are tall and thin, and they have a very long arm span, often that exceeds their height. Uh, the distal portion of the aorta is the most common sign for abdominal aneurysms, so that descending part of the aorta when it's heading down to branch off into your femoral arteries. That's most often the sign where, you'll, where you will see that aneurysm, and you can feel that pulsating mass. Signs and symptoms, tearing chest pain, radiating through the back or tearing abdominal pain, uh, decreased pulses or cold extremities from that decreased blood flow to the femoral arteries, uh, and that pulsating abdominal mass or that rigid abdomen. Uh, if rupture does occurs, occur, cardiac arrest will be almost instantaneous uh, due to the large volume of blood spilling into their abdomen. The only fix for these things is a surgeon. Management of these things in the field uh, really consists of some maintenance fluids, uh, therapy to lower the arterial pressure or the um, systolic blood pressure, and rapid but gentle transport to a facility that has surgical capabilities. Hypertension is a disease that affects almost 30% of Americans. Uh, some studies suggest it's due to our poor diet but that's a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 for sustained periods. Uh, it's increased with atherosclerosis. Uh, it's often a contributing factor to obesity and diabetes. And as we learned previously, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. There are many uh, nonspecific signs like nose bleeding, uh, tremors, nausea, vomiting, headaches, blurred vision. Um, hypertension is a chronic disease, but very treatable with medications. Treatment depends on the severity and the extent of the disease. One of the most common treatments is beta blockers. Uh, things we know about beta blockers, they will prevent your heart rate from going too high. So if a patient's on a beta blocker, you've got to worry about them hiding and masking their signs and symptoms of shock. Other uh, treatments for hypertension include uh, diuretics and digitalis. Syncope is a very common complaint among the elderly. Uh, it could be vasovagal, could be from seizures, could be TIAs, could be orthostatic. There's a lot of different types of syncope. So a good assessment can help you uh, or lead you in the direction of what type of syncope you may be dealing with. Getting into neuro diseases, uh, strokes are very common, seizures, dizziness and vertigo, or Parkinson's and dementia. We're gonna talk through all of these. So strokes fall into two categories. They're either ischemic from a blood clot affecting blood flow to a certain area of the brain or hemorrhagic from a blood vessel rupturing. Uh, signs and symptoms can vary from altered mental status to a coma to slurred speech, vomiting, uh, unconsciousness. So the signs and symptoms of a stroke vary. Treatment for strokes is going to be pretty straightforward and mainly going to consist of rapid transport to a stroke center. Of course, we know around here that our stroke center is WVU. There are many stroke scales out there. Uh, the most common one is the Cincinnati. It includes face, arms, and speech. Uh, is the face drooping? Are the arms drifting to one side when they hold them out in front of them? And is the speech slurred? If you have two or more of those, the odds are you are having a stroke. Uh, and it's important to note the time of last known normal. Without a clearly defined last known normal time, usually intervention cannot be initiated. Uh, intervention needs to happen within three hours if possible. Uh, some cases have done it as far out as six hours, but three hours is preferred. The other big thing that WVU is looking for now before they will issue a stroke page for your patient is a glucose, so that should be one of the first things you get after you ad administer your stroke assessment, should be getting a finger stick glucose so you have a good reading for the stroke team. It's also applicable to fly this patient if you're really far away from WVU so you can get them there within that three hour time window. Talking for a little bit about dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, dementia is a very progressive disease and it's irreversible. Um, Alzheimer's is most often the, they're the most recognized name, um, but Alzheimer's really can't be diagnosed until an autopsy is performed and the brain is examined uh, while the patient is alive. It's just called dementia.
Here's a chart of dementia versus delirium. Delirium is more of a rapid onset temporary thing, while dementia is a chronic and progressive neurological decline. Like I said, dementia is a very progressive disease that will end up ultimately with the patient not knowing much of anything or who anybody is. Uh, the big things for this patient are to be supportive of the family because it's very difficult for the family seeing their relative go through a phase like this where some days they're normal and some days they're out in left field somewhere. And that's how dementia progresses until it ends up where they're completely disoriented to where they are. Parkinson's disease is another progressive neurologic disease. It starts with small tremors and basically moves on till the full body has very little muscle control, if any at all. It can also uh, affect the brain and the conscious thought center of the brain. Sometimes it's hard to differentiate between Parkinson's and dementia. There is a new medicine out for Parkinson's that slows the process of it, but it doesn't cure it. So the end result is often ine inevitable with these diseases. Switching gears to metabolic disorders, uh, diabetes, very common metabolic endocrine disorder uh, that's prevalent with elderly patients. It uh, may be present in stages, um, may start out with symptoms just as fatigue or weakness and move on to full-blown diabetes. Uh, we see often diabetic emergencies with blood sugar that is too low or too high. Um, if you're seeing patients that are chronically calling for low blood sugar, sometimes in the middle of the night, you need to encourage them to go to their doctor and get their medicines fixed because big swings in blood sugar are as bad for the body as chronically high or chronically low. So the goal is to have their sugar regulated to a pretty stable state all the time. Gastrointestinal hemorrhage uh, is divided into two parts, upper and lower, and it's differentiated by what end it's coming out of. So if it's coming out of the mouth, it's an upper. If it's coming out of the other end, it's a lower. Um, with upper and lower, treatment doesn't change a whole lot in the pre-hospital realm. We want to treat the signs and symptoms such as hypotension and tachycardia, but the end result is to get them to a hospital where they can receive the right treatment. Things to look for with gastrointestinal hemorrhage, uh, coffee ground or dark stool or dark emesis uh, is usually venous blood or dry blood. That means it's been there for a while. Bright red blood coming out of either end is a bad sign and that patient needs to get to the hospital quickly. And like I said earlier, we're going to treat the symptoms. We're gonna treat hypotension or pain or nausea as they come and transport them to a facility where they can get the right treatment. Pressure ulcers are ulcers that occur from laying in one position for too long and anywhere where the skin is going to be on a hard surface for a long period of time. So in this patient, you see it on the feet where perhaps their feet were resting on top of each other like they had their legs crossed or maybe on the end of the bed. Uh, they're common in nursing homes. They typically develop from the waist down over bony prominences. Um, the treatment is mainly prevention. Uh, a lot of times when bed sores or pressure ulcers uh, start happening, uh, they end up having to go to wound clinics and the wound never really heals. So the best treatment for these is prevention and education of the nursing home staff to make sure they're turning their patients and rotating their patients hourly or bi-hourly so pressure ulcers don't develop. Environmental emergencies are often a big deal in the elderly because they don't thermoregulate very well anyway. As we said, the body just becomes less efficient with age. Obviously, your elderly patient isn't going to be out skiing and shredding powder and end up hypothermic that way from being out in the cold, but they can end up with subacute or chronic hypothermia from perhaps living in a cold house. Tying it back to the financial issues I talked about earlier, maybe they didn't have enough money to pay their heating bill that month and their house is really cold. Maybe they're using space heaters and it's not doing a very good job. Or perhaps they fell and laid on the floor all night. Just because you find the patient in the house doesn't mean they can't be hypothermic. Floors are very cold, even when the heat's working, and that cold floor conducts heat out of the body. You can find very, very hypothermic elderly patients that have just been on the floor inside a relatively warm house all night. Alcohol abuse is something to worry about with the elderly for a couple reasons. 
The first reason is they don't process it as well as younger people do because their bodies aren't as efficient. As we've said before, the body is just less efficient with age. The other reason is if they're abusing alcohol in their old age, they've probably done it their whole life and are at risk for liver problems. Depression is actually fairly common in the elderly. Uh, you end up with empty nest syndrome or perhaps the loss of the spouse, nobody around to talk to or interact with. So patients can become very depressed. And that goes back to what I said earlier. Sometimes a hand to hold and an ear to listen are the best medicine for our elderly patients. Second to young males, like 24 to 30, uh, the elderly population has the highest rate of suicide out of any population demographic. Um, sometimes it's from terminal illness, perhaps a diagnosis of cancer or something like that. Sometimes it's just from being lonely. So definitely don't rule out the possibility of suicide with your elderly patients. We're going to switch gears here a little bit and talk about trauma in the elderly. Remember that we said before, falls are the leading cause of accidental death in the elderly population. So keep that in the back of your mind as we talk through this. So trauma overall is the leading cause of death in our elderly patients. Uh, osteoporosis or brittling of the bones causes increased affinity for the bones to break. Um, they don't have much of a cardiac reserve or a functional residual capacity to help them compensate for trauma. Um, they have decreased respiratory and renal function, and they have decreased elast elasticity in the peripheral blood vessels, which makes them more prone to bleeding. So some general things for trauma. Remember earlier we talked about the treatment for hypertension was beta blockers, which allows uh, or doesn't allow the heart rate to speed up in response to shock. So keep that in mind as you're assessing your patient. They may still be in shock even though their heart rate isn't up. Perhaps they're on a beta blocker. Uh, one of the best indicators of shock in the elderly is mental status. Uh, trauma often causes bone fractures, like we talked about. Osteoporosis makes the bone brittle, easier to break. Uh, should you choose to immobilize your elderly patient? We know now that immobilization really isn't good for anyone anymore, but say they do fit into that category where you have to immobilize them, uh, make sure you pad the board to fit their body with kyphosis and uh, curvature of the spine, they may not actually lay flat. Um, back when we had to backboard everybody, I saw several people brought into the ER with uh, EMS crews attempting to lay them flat when their spine just didn't go that way. Uh, I'm sure that was very uncomfortable for those patients. So if you do have to backboard them, remember to pad the voids and conform the board to their body because their spine may not go in a straight line anymore. Sepsis is the growing buzzword in our field uh, for all age demographics, but it's especially common in the elderly. You get those patients with indwelling catheters, they get a UTI, perhaps they get pneumonia and can't shake it. There's a bunch of different uh, reasons that the elderly get sepsis, septic. Um, this sepsis criteria here is from an EMS agency. So you take a look down through here. They're 18 and not pregnant, and they have two or more of the following. So their temperature is above 100, their pulse is better than 90, and their respirations are greater than 20. Um, they have a suspected or documented infection, and they have hypoperfusion as indicated by one of those things. Blood pressure less than 90, MAP less than 65, or their lactate greater than 4. I know around here checking a lactate in the field isn't real common, but I think it will get that way in the next few years because the portable lactate meters are becoming more cost effective. Um, but I wanted you guys to look at a sepsis criteria from an EMS agency to see what other people were doing uh, in our field. And sepsis is becoming more common and uh, it is something that we're seeing more and more. The treatment for sepsis, uh, regardless of the age, is to treat with fluid at least 20 cc's per kilo, if not more. Um, and then you always bring up the age-old question of, well, they have congestive heart failure. Could my fluid resuscitation make that worse? What if I give them pulmonary edema? I'll say a few things about that. One of them is most of the population of America is a little bit dehydrated in some form or another, so a little bit of fluid isn't going to hurt anybody. 
And the biggest way to combat this is to reassess your patient frequently. Uh, you know, you don't have to dump all 20 cc's per kilo in them in 30 seconds. Dump it in slowly. Give 250, recheck their lung sounds. Give 250, recheck their lung sounds. If you see any signs of edema starting to happen, stop your fluid. But the biggest treatment for sepsis is fluid resuscitation. They need, uh, you know, most of the time patients end up getting two to three liters uh, before they go up to the ICU for sepsis. So fluid resuscitation is extremely important. But do your fluid resuscitation with some common sense and reassess that patient that might have some heart failure and make sure you're not putting it all in their lungs. So thank you guys for listening. I hope you learned something. And please check us out on the YouTube or at PierpontEMS.com for more great educational videos.